Okay. Um, good, good morning, everyone. Um, so, and, and thank you very much for the, um, for the welcome. Uh, we are two Italian Stefanos, so uh, as you know, all Italians are named Stefano, and that's, uh, that's a very known fact. And in fact, Cristoforo Mune, who is another speaker and trainer here, is not a real Italian, because he's not called Stefano. Um, this is the two of us. Uh, we try to fill in the blanks in Stefano's biography with a PhD <laughs> comics comic about this. Um, Stefano uh, is uh, my PhD student at Politecnico. And is the actual expert on what we are going to talk about. I'm, I'm just pretending, as all professors do. Um, so we are going to talk about Ken. Uh, being this an hardware conference, we don't really need a lot of introduction. But just uh, a, a, as a way to get us started, uh, Ken is the most uh, um, used standard in uh, the automotive world for own vehicle networks connecting all of the critical components uh, on the vehicle and also most of the non-so critical components, which is part of the problem. Now, of course, uh, if you are here, there's an entire automotive village outside, uh, you know about uh, the uh, attacks on, out, uh, on uh, vehicles. Here I have just put on uh, two of the most famous, but then you have uh, tens and tens of colleagues that have worked on that. Just wanted to acknowledge Mark Rogers' work on Tesla and, uh, uh, of course, Charlie and Chris work on trying to kill journalists. Um, so uh, the, uh, the question is, however, how is uh, the uh, CAN bus connected to this type of attack? And the reality is it is connected and it is not at the same time. Uh, because basically what happens is not that CAN per se is attacked, but that some of the characteristics of CAN that follow from the fact that it is uh, meant to be on a trusted network uh, and uh, not connected to the outside world are used uh, by colleagues uh, in their attacks uh, to uh, um, perform attacks on the vehicle itself. So the fact that you can, for instance, uh, uh, transmit uh, frames uh, without being authenticated, or the fact that you can uh, broadcast messages on CAN and have them heard by all the uh, connected devices and all the connected ECUs, uh, is used to perform an attack. This research is not about that. This research is about a weakness in CAN itself. Which is, uh, uh, which is kind of a different angle uh, to that. Um, there is an interesting part in this research. So if you have seen the uh, title, the title is uh, It's Easier to Break Than to Patch. And patching this type of attacks is actually pretty difficult. Because at the moment, uh, what happens is that either you go the long route of trying to uh, develop secure software for each of those ECUs and then trying to figure out a way around uh, the lack of authentication and the lack of integrity of Ken, or uh, you try to detect attacks. And there's a number of startups and, uh, uh, and also uh, established automotive suppliers that have come up with different intrusion detection systems. Uh, we are not uh, singling out these ones. We just uh, took a couple of images from uh, famous, uh, uh, from websites of famous uh, vendors of uh, IDS uh, for automotive. Now, intrusion detection is actually a type of technology that we know very well from the uh, computer science and computer engineering world more than from the vehicle world. It has been tried uh, for a number of years. Uh, actually, when I was uh, Stefano's age, uh, my PhD thesis was on machine learning for intrusion detection. And guess what? It didn't work back then, but they didn't realize and they gave me my PhD as the same. Uh, it doesn't work still now. It's a very hard thing to do. So in reality, IDS for, um, for uh, automotive are basically an industrial secret. So we don't know how these different companies approach it. But if you think about it, uh, there's basically two or three ways to go about it. One way is uh, to uh, try to perform some sort of frequency-based analysis. Can as some specific frequencies, so you think that an attacker, for instance, if they are trying to flood the bus, uh, is going to perform some type, of, uh, some type of different frequency in the transmission of messages. Um, a second way, which is very typical of intrusion detection systems in general, not just on CAN, is uh, to use specifications. There's a set of rules that apply to data messages. You try to define them as strictly as possible for the specific vehicle 
the, the IDS or IPS is supposed to work on and you try to enforce uh, those rules. In practice, you try to build uh, the protocol specifications on top uh, of CAN, which only has transport specifications. Um, this is uh, uh, potentially dynamic because potentially these things depend on the previous message history, depends on, the, on which state the vehicle is in. So you can build this as complex as you want uh, and make it fail as, as, ba as badly as you want, basically. But this is one approach. The, the final approach that you can find, mostly I think in academia, I don't really think that there's much uh, application of this in the real world uh, uh, of automotive intrusion detection, but I would be personally interested because machine learning for intrusion detection has long been one of the things that I do. Um, machine learning is, uh, by all means, uh, very similar to this, uh, with the difference that you are trying to have the machine build it for you. That's, that's the difference. But from the point of view of the concept, uh, most uh, uh, of what you can do is either frequency-based or based on specifications. Now, how do we evade such a thing? Now, if we uh, have a specification-based uh, IDS, the general way to evade it is to try to comply with the rules. You try to create messages that after all, uh, are realistic messages. This is not hard to do. Since you can pretend to be another uh, ECU of the vehicle, you can generally uh, create messages that can, uh, at the same time, break havoc on the vehicle and be perfectly valid. Of course, this requires the attacker to have a deeper understanding of the vehicle. So putting an IDS like this inside the vehicle kind of raises the bar, but not really that much. Frequency-based is can be a little bit trickier because some attacks really require the attacker to change or to send more frequent messages than you would think. But you can think of a number of attacks that can comply with standard frequencies. Uh, in the case of machine learning, it, there's a, an entire set of machine learning research dedicated to so-called mimicry attacks. Attacks where you try to generate an attack that is sufficiently similar to uh, a normal behavior of the system so that it can uh, trick a machine learning intrusion detector. This is not something new. It's something that is known since the 80s. So it's basically as old as me. The perfect way to do this, though, is to actually go and manipulate one of the frames that has been actually generated by an ECU. Because if you can do this, you are automatically matching all of these, uh, uh, all of these uh, um, uh, possibilities for evading an IDS. If you can just manipulate frames on the bus, uh, and you do so without egregiously violating specifications, of course, uh, you can basically fly below the radar of most uh, approaches to intrusion detection. Um, so uh, we started thinking about this, uh, and we started thinking about uh, how the um, CAN bus works. Uh, so I, uh, of course, I would say that probably many of the people here already know, but just as a recall for the few that may not know. Um, you have uh, inside each ECU the controller that has to send some data, the CAN controller that implements the CAN specification and handles the errors on the CAN, this is critical to our attack. And then the transceiver just uh, translates uh, whatever needs to be sent uh, into the electrical signal to send on the CAN. Now, uh, the data frames on the CAN are uh, something like this. Uh, I will not dive in depth uh, also because uh, Stefano will tease you with the meaning of each of the single fields. The uh, things that are important for me at the moment are uh, the existence of the arbitration field here at the beginning of the message and uh, the data field. Here there's just one byte, but the CAN is actually uh, 60, uh, 64 bits, 8 bytes. Um, the, uh, the bus of the CAN is created with uh, two lines and uh, uh, transmits bytes uh, by, pot by power difference. So. Uh, basically, when you send a zero, uh, the zero creates uh, a power difference uh, between the two lines of the can. When you send, want to send a one, the two lines uh, of the can have the same voltage. 
This means uh, uh, two things. The first thing is that uh, one of the uh, bits is dominant and the other is recessive. And so one of the bits overrides the other. The other thing is that uh, basically since uh, all the ECUs are sending their uh, identifier as uh, arbitration field, any ECU that uh, finds uh, that it's reading on the bus something different than what it's transmitting figures out that it has lost arbitration. It has lost the right to transmit, and so it stops. Um, this mechanism works generally well. However, of course, uh, errors can occur. Sometimes uh, an ECU can uh, read something that is different than what it has written, on the bus for some other reason. Usually the reasons are uh, a transceiver failure or there has been some channel noise because of course it's a vehicle, it's running around, there's, uh, the, the power is not necessarily as stable as we would want it to be. Uh, there can be another faulty device that is doing something weird. There's a number of reasons for that. And in these cases, uh, what happens is that the um, device that is transmitting says, hey, this is, this is not correct, there's something wrong, by sending six zeros, which is an error frame. So uh, what happens is that uh, if you are designing a device, or if you are designing the protocol, really, you need to figure out a way so that, because if a device has received a fault and this fault is just transient, it will want to talk again. <coughs> But the transceiver of the device could be broken. If the transceiver of the device is broken for some reason, or the device has some other fault, you don't want it to keep trying to talk on the bus which is shared every single time. So you have an error management mechanism. And basically, every time that uh, uh, the um, ECU finds uh, that uh, it has sent something in an error, we said it sends... Uh, these six zeros uh, as an error code. Now, it doesn't do this indefinitely. The uh, ECU has a counter. This counter is increased by eight every time there is an error, decreased by one every time a transmission is successful. If the counter exceeds uh, uh, 127, the uh, ECU changes its, uh, uh, changes its behavior becoming error passive because it's basically it's in a state where it's starting to think this is probably th this ECU's fault. If uh, the counter exceeds uh, 255, uh, so if this ECU uh, exceeds 255, it actually shuts itself off the bus. And this uh, means that it doesn't talk anymore until it's either reset uh, turn it off and on again in the computer scientist's world, or uh, it detects uh, 11 sequential ones, uh, which means uh, the bus uh, is uh, transmitting free, basically, uh, 128 times uh, for the bit time. So evidently there's not so much noise, it can think to start talking again. Now, once you have said all this, which is all the theory, which professors are good at, let's see what we can do to try to exploit this behavior and make something bad happen. How do we do that? Okay, so um, at this point, we have a way to shut the target ECU of the network. And, at this, and after it's shutting the ECU of the network, we would be able to actually spoof their, its messages without having that ECU writing something different than what we want to at the same time, right? To do this specifically, we're going to abuse the, both the error handling, both the full confinement rules. So while the ECU is writing its message, we can actually... So the ECU, while it's writing its message, is assuming that she it is the only one that can write on the bus, right? So if there's an error, it's done by itself. But actually, the DCU is not the only thing that can write on the bus. We're on a shared bus, we can do whatever we want. All the others, all the compliant DCUs are not going to write because they know they lost arbitration. But if we are a malicious, I'm sorry, a malicious attacker, what we can do is just wait for the DCU to send its um, arbitration field, 
wait for the issue to win the arbitration, and then during the um, sending of the data, for example, find the one. We know that we can overwrite ones with zeros on the bus. So find the one, and at this point, we can be the ones flipping that bit to, from a one to a zero. In this way, the issue will think that itself was the uh, cause of the error, right? Um, and will start failing, will start sending error, me error messages. So the whole complete attack is pretty easy. Mm, we can think of dividing it, dividing it in five ways. The first thing is we have to discover the IDs of the ECU that we want to attack. And this can be done by reverse engineering, for example. I'm, I'm sure that the car hacking village here somehow teaches you. I've, I've never been there yet, but I assume that this may be something that you can do trying to understand how an ID is related to an ECU or not. Now that you know the, 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 which, what ID you are searching for, you have to wait for the ID on the bus. So you just wait for it and search for the ID to come up. And once the ECU wins the arbitration, at this point, you have to find the recessive bit in the packet. You can use whatever recessive bit you want. There's a lot of them. Um, can implement bit stuffing. So after five bits of, um, of a polarity, you will always have one of the other, of the other polarity. So you're sure you can find a one, uh, for, Comfort, we use this here C delimiter, which is by definition one. Uh, so we wait for that and we flip, we flip that bit. We flip, we change it with a zero. And at this point, we trigger the error. Now, this specific error, as Stefan explained before, it increases the counter and this specific error increases the counter of eight. So if we do this for 32 times, the issue is off the network. Sounds pretty easy. It is pretty easy. We try to implement it both on a test bed in lab. So we have a CANTECT, which is a USB to CAN interface, which is our victim. The canvas is that beautiful bluish thing on the breadboard. Uh, then we have a scan tool, which we just use to detect that this U actually died. Um, and then there's the attacker. The attacker is just a simple Arduino uh, with uh, not a traditional CAN controller. So you can buy CAN controllers for Arduino. They are kind of cheap. They cost like nine euros. But you can choose that because you don't want the uh, controller to handle errors. So you have to buy a CAN transceiver, which is that thing there, which is extremely small. And the only thing it does is translating the bits into electric, electric, electric signals. All the CAN controller is done inside the Arduino via software. Um, we did a couple of experiments on this. We wanted to be sure we were able to read everything on the bus uh, without losing bits. So we started for 24 hours, for 24, 24 hours, sorry. Uh, and we sent about 9 million frames. The accuracy was definitely high. So we were sure we were able to understand what was, what was happening on the bus, on the bus bit by bit. But then obviously it's not funny to implement the actual attack on the test bed. So we did it on an, uh, on an Alpha Giulietta. Uh, the whole thing was first decide which, what we want to attack, and we decided to attack the parking sensor module because the Alpha Giulietta was ours, so we wanted to be sure we didn't break anything that was disruptive for the driving, or you had to explain to the um, insurance, insurance why you know you break something. Um, anyway, we choose the parking sensor module, which is not disruptive, and at this point we connected the uh, um, a contact and a computer to the uh, OBD2 port, and we started dumping data searching for the AD. To search for the AD, what we did was just getting closer and further away from the car, from the sensors of the car, up until we saw the data changing of a specific ID, and we found it, so this ID. At this point, we can implement the attack. Um, the attack is, again, pretty easy. This is just a demo video. I hope it starts. If it doesn't, I have it somewhere else. So basically, you just, we just wanted to make sure that the parking sensor module was working before um, the attack started, and it does. Because if we get to the um, reverse gear, the parking sensor module starts beeping and telling us that there's a problem. Now, if we just connect the Arduino to the to the bus. I could have made it like two per. But yeah, the point is that in the second we connect the Arduino to the bus, 
the parking sensor module dies and it stops working even if we try to move it and up, up until the Arduino is there it won't start again we won't be able to use it now obviously the parking sensor module is not uh, a big threat but you can imagine that this thing in the same as that way works for every single DCU on the bus okay now and just as a and just as a side note, uh, this is implemented with the Arduino from the outside just to show it, but of course it could be implemented with the transceiver of another ECU. Yeah, with what, control. what we wanted to do was prove that a cheap device can be uh, used to, at, uh, to, can be attacked to the bus, uh, and you don't even need a lot of money or a, a really complicated thing that reads bit by bit. It's, it's the, the CAN controller is, is, sorry, the CAN frequency is low enough that you don't really need that much power. Now at this point, okay, at this point, uh, the real question here is, is it preventable? Because we, the attack has been proven possible, we want to know if we find a way to detect it. Specifically, we would like to prevent it. And the answer is no, we cannot prevent it, sadly, uh, which is the reason for the beginning of the talk, the, the, the name of the talk, which is it's easier to break than to patch. You can truly really patch everything. And the reason for this in this specific case is that um, the attack is based on the protocol specifications. So we can't really distinguish between an actual ECU failure or the attack because they behave in the same exact way. Uh, we also thought about trying to like retrieve logs uh, to distinguish between, like to make a machine learning algorithm distinguish between uh, an actual error or the attack, but apparently these logs do, do not exist and I won't be able to take an ECU connected to a bus and wait for the five year for it to fail you to fail like and then at a certain point have an available log. So we weren't able to use anything. But the good thing about this is that um as Stefano begin as Stefano explained at the beginning, we have two different scenarios for this. Stefano hinted at this. Um the first one is making this attack for the sake of using it. Like the goal of the attack is, is implementing the attack. For example, in a ransomware. In a ransomware, you can imagine you have uh, hacked into the infotainment system of the car and you say, hey, pay up. And at the same time, you connect to the can, to the CAN bus and you delete the messages from the key fob, for example, to the engine. So the car cannot start. So this, we can't avoid it. It's impossible, at least not on the CAN level. Obviously, you will, we, we hope you're able to avoid this by not implementing something broken on the infotainment system. But this said, the second attack scenario, it's more interesting for us, which is, what if the attacker wants to use this attack to dodge the intrusion detection systems that we presented before? Frequency and, um, and, and payloads are both easier to avoid as an intrusion detection system if we can shut down the issue that is talking and just be us on the, on the bus, right? So this is preventable, this is detectable at least, and what we managed to do was create a device which connects to the, to, the, to the bus without having to modify anything else but the device, and read the data that are passing on the bus, and try to understand how the counters of each ECU are increasing due to what is passing on the bus. Doing this, we are able to know when the ECU goes bus off, and hence, in the moment this use bus off for us and someone tries to spoof the message of DCU, we will know that that message was not sent by the ECU itself. The annoying part of this is these are the rules of CAN that we had to try to understand. These are the 12 rules that explain how the counters increase. Uh, obviously, we are not going to explain them all, just a part of them. Um, but this is the core of the thing. We wanted to understand if these rules are visible from the bus itself. And the ones that we are interested about are these ones. The th number three, I will read them for you because I assume you cannot read from the back. But the idea is, rule number three says, when a transmitter sends an error flag, the, trans the transmit error count, which is the one that we care about, not the receiving error count, the transmit error count, which is the one that can kick the ECU off the network. So when a transmitter sends an error flag, the transmit error count is increased by eight, which is what happened at the beginning with, with our attack, right? So this is easy to see because we can just look for the idea of an ECU and if we see um, an error on the payload of that, uh, of that message, that ID, the, sorry, the ECU which has that ID will have his tech increased by 8. There are two exceptions to this which are uh, 
finally extremely easy to implement because to implement them we just have to do nothing because there are true exceptions but the point is they are not visible so we wouldn't be able to detect them but we don't have to because they don't increase the transmitter of counter. Um, the most annoying rule is rule number four, which says that if a transmitter detects a bit error while sending an active error flag, the transmitter error counts is increased. Now, the problem is that in this case, the ECU is sending an error while detecting an error, and it won't send another one to tell us that it made an error, um, which makes, makes means that we are not able to see this at all. We cannot detect this on the bus. The, the good thing about this, though, is that since the ECU is sending zeros, the attacker cannot abuse of this in any way because the attacker cannot override a zero with a one. It can only do the opposite. It can only overwrite a one with a zero. So we can detect it, but at least the attacker cannot expo uh, exploit it. Rule number six has a whole slide for it because it's complicated. Rule number seven just says that, uh, well, as Stefano said, if I'm sending correct messages, my counter decreases. Again, extremely easy to detect on the bus. We just see if the message passes. And if the message passes, the counter is decreased. Rule number ten. The, sorry, rule number ten says that when the counter reaches two hundred and fifty-six, this use of the bus. And again, this is extremely easy to detect. Lastly, I finished after this. I'm sorry. Uh, rule number twelve says that uh, if the ECU is off the bus and detects one hundred and twenty-eight times eleven consecutive ones, then it is on the bus again, and we can detect this too just by counting the number of eleven consecutive ones that we see. Rule six um, is the most complicated one and the one that had that created us more issues in understanding whether it was possible to detect it or it was a big problem. And it says, I don't want to explain it all, I just want to get to the first point. And the node tolerates up to seven consecutive dominant bits after sending an active error flag. And the reason for this is that the active error flag is composed of six zeros, which is by definition an error in CAN, because, because CAN accept a maximum of five consecutive identical bits. So when you send six zeros, what you're doing is literally making an obvious error so that everyone knows that you made an error. Okay? So everyone else will react by telling you that you made an error, sending other six zeros, and we have 12. The, <clears throat> the 13th one is just there, we assume for uh, potential delays in of one bit time in the reaction of some issues, but the fourteenth bit, so the eight after the first error flag, will definitely be a problem because it means that something is wrong and someone is sending zeros on the bus, which is potentially the the writer because it's the one that usually has the bus. Now this is detectable. The problem is this. So Kate, we have two cases. In the first case, the victim wants to send a one and another one, and the attacker lets the victim send the first one, but it covers the second and starts overwriting everything with zeros. In this case, um, after six bits, we will have the seven counts, and after four, the 14th bit, we're going to be the one that counts plus eight. Second case, the victim sends a one, then five zeros, then another one, and this second one is overwritten. Again, the, vi the, the, the victim is going to start counting from this bit, but as you can see, if we see on the bus what we're seeing, is the same exact thing. So we cannot detect the difference between these two. The good thing, the bad thing about this is that, again, we are not completely sure what is happening, but the good thing is that the case of victim two, if, if we decide to implement case two, so wait for the maximum time before counting plus eight, the attacker would be able to implement case one and just avoid the intrusion detection system. If we do the opposite though, the attacker has no way of detecting the problem, of, of uh, exploiting the problem. The counter, the problem of this is that obviously it creates a slight, slight chance um, of having a false positive, which means there is a really small, really, really small chance of an ECU not not malicious being considered as so. Anyway, at this point we have considered all the twelve rules and <clears throat> we found a way to it. We implemented them in a finite state machine to read the bus and detect every one of the things that we wanted to and that I just explained. And this is the result. Uh, the idea is we, don't, we are not using the traditional CAN controller of CAN. We completely rewrite it. And we just read the bit one by one and try to count alongside all these ECUs uh, their, their transmit error counter. In this way, we know when the ECU is bus off. And this implements the whole thing. 
Copycan, we gave the name of the, th uh, we gave a name to the intrusion detection system, which is Copycan. And the idea is, uh, we have to first decide which IDs to defend. After we know which IDs to defend, we start monitoring the bus from the beginning of communication to the end of communication. Uh, we count the transmitter or counter of each ECU while doing this and detect when an ECU goes bus off, if it does. Up until now, we can't tell if there's an attack. We only know which ECUs are up and which are not. But the problem is that, again, if at this moment the uh, attacker starts writing again on the bus on behalf of the ECU, we know that the ECU is not the one sending messages. So we can flag this as an attack. Now, a brief excursus on reactions because it is interesting to, this, to understand what you can do in these cases. So you can't really just say to the driver, hey, there's a virus, or hey, there's a problem, right? Because what is it going to do? We were discussing this a long time ago. You can just make appear like a, a small uh, hacker on the, on the dashboard telling, hey, there's an hacker in your car. You won't be able to do it. And even if you do, what's the point of it? What's the solution? If the attacker wants to do something, he has already done it. Pull over you... slowly and call the cyber police. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so the, the one of the ideas that has been proposed during the last years is that of moving to a degraded mode. So shutting out the electronics from the car and just manage you to get to the uh, first mechanic by driving almost just in the old way. And at this point, um, hoping that your mechanic is able to um, reflash the ECU that has been attacked or something like that. The problem about this is that the more we get, we get to electronic and electric cars and super connected cars, we won't be able to do this because we can't bypass the electronics to control the car. And the second problem is that it is expensive for the manufacturer to force you to go to the, to the mechanic every time. The second case is what they actually do right now, the intrusion detection systems that we presented at the beginning. They don't do nothing, but they save all the logs and they send them to the manufacturer. In this way, you uh, at least know what happened and how it happened so that you can avoid it for the next time. And, that you, and, and you can add more rules, for example, uh, to avoid the attacks in, in the future which is actually functioning, but it's not solving the problem right now. The last case is we can attack the attacker because our can controller is identical to the one of the attacker. So we can actually implement the same attack that we presented before on the intrusion detection system and attack everyone that tries to spoof messages. The really good thing is that in this way, no one is able to convince anyone else of something on the bus. You can spoof messages because I will always delete them. And, and tell everyone that your messages are wrong. Even if you keep on doing it, even if you are not compliant with the CAN full confinement so you won't shut down, I will, I, I will keep on telling you, telling everyone that your messages are false. The bad thing is that uh, since rule six is extremely annoying, there's a really slight chance that we kill the ECU even if the ECU has not been attacked. Now, Thanks to rule 12, which was the one that said you can come back on the bus, technically this problem auto-solves itself after a short while because the ECU, which is not broken, will come back on the bus and will not be considered wrong. But still, this is an issue because we have false positives. Finally, <clears throat> last thing. So we tried to understand whether this worked. We knew it worked by th on theory and we knew we were already able to read the bus uh, bit by bit because we did the test for the attack. What we really wanted to understand was how often these this rules, number four and number six specifically, which are the ones that we cannot detect, create issues in, the, in understanding whether there was an attack or not. So to implement this, we had the attacker, which is an Arduino Uno, and the copy can on the other side, which is another, which is another Arduino Uno, and two can texts connected to the canvas. The two can texts are, are on one side, one is, is acting as a traffic generator. It just sends data on the bus. And the, and the other one is the protected issue. The idea is we let them talk for a while and we let them collide for a while, hoping that if they have to trigger errors, they are going to trigger errors one with the other because they are talking one on top of the other. If they don't, there is a lower chance at least that rule four and six are generally happening often in the wild. And to do this, we, we did the same test for 50 times. We sent 15,000 frames, and after 15,000 frames, we turned on the attacker. And all 50,000, oh, sorry, all 50 times, the 
uh, intrusion detection system were perfectly on, were on time in detecting that the ECU was uh, being attacked and 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 shut off the network. Okay, so in conclusion, DOS for can is not preventable. It's easier to break than to patch, so we can't really prevent the denial of service itself. Uh, but we do have a solution for the ghost of the attacker, for one of the ghosts of the attacker. Um, yeah, I have finished. If you have any question, I hope I've been clear enough in explaining what is happening. Uh, if you have any question, I'm more than happy to answer, although I don't know what time is it. No, yeah, we have time. Uh, so if you have any questions. So I'm not a car security expert, but uh, speaking of solutions, do you think um, signing or encrypting CAN messages would prevent a, a lot of similar attacks? This is actually a smart question. Uh, the brief answer is yes and no, because the problem of encryption is that it creates computation problems. Uh, on automotive uh, environments, you don't have high-end, higher-end uh, computers. You have really small devices that are really cheap. Uh, and you want real time for many of these messages. So if you encrypt and decrypt the message, you are requesting for both the sender and the receiver to have either higher computation power or have more time to translate them to, to sorry, yeah, to, to decode the message. It has been proved, sorry, <clears throat> it has been proposed. It is, I don't know if it is done in the actual market because again, um, my, uh, what's the name? Market secret? Yeah. Okay. But in general, it is a really known potential uh, possibility, but usually the idea is if you have uh, two high-end ACUs, you can protect them, and you do it, maybe, but you can protect the whole network because some are not going to be able to keep up with the translation. If I can uh, add a couple of things. The first is, it was like this also as a student. You asked him a simple question, and he gave you a really, a really complicated answer. The second is... Um, Besides that, uh, um, there is, uh, however, um, a general trend uh, in the automotive industry to try to think about alternatives to CAN. So probably it's going to happen easier that uh, uh, the automotive industry just moves on to automotive Ethernet or another standard than um, yeah, so this, this specific. The difference between, uh, because this would deny our work because we're saying yeah, what can doesn't work anymore. The difference is that our the idea of our device is that you can just connect it and it works. Um, implementing authentication on ECUs means re redesigning the ECU, uh, which probably won't be done for a CAN for a long time. At a certain point, we'll try to move towards other techniques and buses. Other questions? There's one right in the front. Um, I was wondering, um, you had to write a, a software CAN controller to make this attack work. I was wondering, do most CAN devices that are on a car CAN bus have programmable controllers, or are they actually hardware? Smart controllers? question again. Uh, some are, some are not. <laughs> I have to answer with a complex answer. Um, <laughs> so there are many that has that have a hardware CAN controller that you can modify, and you can't implement the attack in that way. There's another attack, though, that you can implement in that case, which is less probable to work, but does the same exact thing. Uh, and if you're interested, I, I, I should try to find it, but I, I, I can tell you later. Uh, so the idea is, yes, uh, there's not all CAN controllers are reprogrammable for the, by the attacker. Some are, but even if they weren't, there's still another way of doing a similar thing. Uh, so the intrusion system makes sense. We don't consider the threat model where the attacker is already inside the car. We consider that the threat model where the attacker is outside, which I assume was the, the point of the question. Would it be possible to create a kind of a uh, CAN hub that uh, every single CAN device connects to that filters uh, messages? Uh, can, what do you mean, sir? Uh, oh, oh, okay, sorry. So oh. that um, as soon as it detects that uh, one device is transmitting the same ID as another device, it would say, well, that's odd. That's not what I'm... So either you switch it, and then you can kill it, but if you want to hub, if you use a hub, you can just do the same thing with can general uh, bus, because it's slow enough for you to literally override the, the things 
that are passing while they're passing. So you can change a bit after you understand what that bit is. Yeah, no, I think that the question was, if I understood it correctly, if you could change the general way the architecture of vehicles is designed um, to a star instead of a... If, instead of a the, instead sorry, of yeah. A um, if you go for switched devices, yes, but again, you are adding delays, uh, which is the main reason for which you go for CAN. I, I would say that if you add a, um, a hub or you just use the bus, the big, there's no big differences in the, um, both in the delays, but both in the attacks and defenses because the hub shouldn't be intelligent, I would call it. Um, but generally speaking, yeah, the, the most, the biggest problem is that you want to be fast, you want to be real time. So the shorter the cable and the shorter connection you have to do, the, the better. But they are moving to that in, in, uh, uh automotive internet. It's always, it's, it's, everything is switched in automotive internet, technically. I think that's about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.